And so now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell is a Citrus IPM specialist and research entomologist. And today she's speaking from the Lynn Cove Research and Extension Center on citrus thrips. So now I'll pass this over to Beth. Okay. Little technology here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is really exciting for me. It's sort of a brainchild of Ben Faber's and mine to communicate more to people in an easy format, a little higher technology than meeting at a field meeting. And I, I think it's gonna, I, I don't know, I'm just really excited because I have information to share and lots of people wanna listen. So it's kind of like a radio program in some ways. Um, today we're gonna talk about citrus thrips biology and management. And along the way, we're gonna do some polling and some quizzing. So hopefully you'll find it a, at least a little bit interactive. And as she said, uh, you can communicate with us on the, in the chat area. So citrus thrips, what do we have here? Here's the life cycle. And um, we've got reproducing females that insert their eggs into leaf tissue, uh, fruit, and mostly fruit and flush. And those eggs hatch after a period of time. And you have the little first instars, which then molt into second instars. And later on, very briefly, they go through a pro-pupa and a pupal stage in order to develop their wings. And citrus thrips have both um, adult females and adult males. And about a third of the pupation occurs in the tree itself in cracks and crevices and about two thirds in the soil. And that's of significance when we have wet years. So there's the life cycle of the citrus thrips. Citrus thrips attack leaves and very young fruit. Um, most of the time we tell you don't worry about the leaves. And of these stages, um, the second instar is the most damaging to the citrus, um, probably because it has bigger mouth parts. And so that is the, the target of, of control, but often people begin spraying before they see seconds, knowing that the life cycle is fairly short and the, they go from first to second pretty quickly. Citrus thrips are thigmotactic, which means they like to crawl into tight spaces, such as under the sepals of young fruit. And they use their mandible to pierce the cells. They have kind of a strange, in my view, being an entomologist, a strange set of mouth parts in that their mandible is really like a spear. Usually mouth parts are in, in two pieces, but this is more like a, a spear. And they stab cells and then they drink up the fluid with their straw-like stylets and round and round they go at the top end of the fruit there. And um, as they go, they, they create these ring scars. So most of the focus on protecting young fruit uh, from these first and second instar thrips is to minimize the severe scarring. If fruit has very slight scarring, as in one and two shown here, then as the fruit matures, generally it doesn't look very bad um, you can't see the scarring very well and the fruit grade isn't diminished. But if the scarring is quite severe, the three and the four level, then um, the, the citrus is likely to be downgraded in the packing house. And of course, growers uh, receive much lower um, uh, returns on, on fruit that is downgraded. Now, all insects develop based on temperature. Uh, we call these degree days. You add the minimum temperature of the day and the maximum temperature and then divide by two. And that gives you um, the, actually this is written wrong, that gives you the average daily temperature. So thrips develop beginning when the average daily temperature is 58 degrees. In contrast, the citrus tree, trees also develop based on temperature. Its lower developmental threshold is 49 degrees. So they're each developing at different rates and have sort of a different trigger threshold at which they be begin to develop. So why is this important? Well, there are about seven generations of thrips growing on citrus. And the very first generation is primarily um, on the leaves and twigs in the early spring. And sometimes that matches up with petal fall and susceptible fruit, and sometimes it doesn't match up at all because of temperature. If the spring temperature tends to be cool, the citrus is gonna go ahead and develop, 
but the thrips might not. They might be waiting for the warmer temperatures. And so sometimes we see thrips and petal fall occur exactly the same time, and sometimes we see them occur at different times. And so you may or may not need to spray directly at petal fall. So here are the seven to eight generations of citrus thrips per year. The most important generations are the second and third. These are the ones that are damaging that small fruit that has the really tender rind on it. And um, this kind of damage occurs from petal fall until the fruit is about one and a half inches in diameter. Um, so you can see generation one is kind of before petal fall, two occurs primarily at or after petal fall, and then generations three through eight occur after that. So you can see here the second and the third generations are the most important in terms of damaging fruit. Thrips pupate primarily in the soil. So during dry hot years, the pupae seem to survive better and the, and the temperatures accelerate the development of the thrips. And so we see a lot more thrips pressure, we call it, in during those dry hot years. In wet cool years, the development of the thrips is slowed down and we think that the moisture in the soil helps to pr promote microorganisms that attack the thrips and so the, they don't pupate, they don't complete their pupation very well and um, the populations are generally lower. So the past six to eight years we have had some pretty warm springs and some pretty hefty pressure of citrus thrips. Now Joe Morris uh, wrote an article um, in the winter 2016 Citrograph Journal and showed over the years in the uh, variety trials what kinds of damage he has observed, uh, both severe and slight damage. The blue area is the severe damage, the red is, is slight damage. And you can see very clearly here that when you look at different varieties, some varieties are just much more easily damaged than others. Generally it's the navels that are easily damaged. Um, the mandarins and valentias less so, um, probably the, the valentias least of all. Cheryl is going to be monitoring the chat area and taking the questions and I suspect that she will interrupt me if she needs to in order to um, get your questions answered. Other than that we'll be taking some breaks and so you will, you will, we will get to all the questions. So Non-bearing citrus is a really big issue. Um, if you treat non-bearing citrus trees frequently because they, they're likely more susceptible to thrips because they're young and they're flushing rapidly, you could select the thrips for resistance before there's even fruit on the tree. And so that's why there have been many restrictions um, in the industry on the labels of citrus pesticides um, to say that they can or can't be used during um, non-bearing citrus situations because there was great concern that they would be overused um, on that foliage and, and select the populations before there's even fruit on the trees. Joe Morris and I did some work in the early 90s um, to, and he did some work in the 80s to look at if you treat citrus trees constantly with insecticides to protect them from citrus thrips or do nothing, do you see any difference in truck di trunk diameter or yield in years four and five um, after they've you know, matured and started producing fruit? And with both Valentias and Navels, we saw no difference whatsoever. Now, those experiments were conducted in the 90s. Now we have mandarins um, last, six or eight years we've had some pretty severe drought and heat conditions so I would qualify I used to say don't treat young mandarins so aggressively for citrus thrips because it's really not impacting their development um, but I think I would qualify that now by saying we're in a much more stressful situation and we need to study mandarins and we need to look at the um, the impact of drought on this whole system Monitoring citrus thrips. Um, this is the hardest part for the pest control advisors. 
you start at petal fall and you sample 100 fruit a couple times a week in each block because things can change really rapidly. Uh, choose healthy green outside fruit, sample between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. because that's when the thrips are active. Sample the stem end for first and second instars as shown here and sample from petal fall until the fruit reaches at one and a half inches. It's a very intensive time of year. And from that, you can calculate the percentage of fruit that's infested. Um, I think a lot of the IPM literature was developed based on navels in the 90s. And, um, and it was based on an era when insecticide, the primary insecticides were organophosphates and carbamates. And now we're in a different era. We, we hardly use those chemicals except maybe for katydids and um, in the spring. And the newer chemicals either work slowly or they don't work the same way. And I think a lot of these thresholds that were developed in the 90s and that we include in the IPM guidelines um, are less pertinent than they used to be. I think the tendency now is to treat as soon as you see thrips. And um, I think that is a good rule of thumb. I would not treat automatically at petal fall because sometimes, as I said, the temperatures are such that the thrips development is offset from the tree development. And we saw a little bit of that this past spring where it suddenly got cold and the thrips stopped developing and then they started up again. So it, it would be better to time your insecticide treatments for when there are actually thrips there than to just go with petal fall. But of course, there's always limitations in, in access to spray rigs and things like that to get the job done. So I understand that sometimes you just have to go based on calendar. But the preference from an IPM standpoint is to um, wait until you see some thrips on the fruit. So one of the big questions in the early spring is how do I tell citrus thrips from flower thrips? Um, well, once the flowers all fall off the tree, the flower thrips go away. So it's easy at that. But the, the really difficult time is right at petal fall when there's still lots of petals on the tree and there are all these thrips moving about in there and they're all active and, it, and how do you tell them apart and your eyes aren't tuned up because you haven't looked at them in a while. Um, so basically it's um, a matter of size and body shape. The citrus thrips are much shorter um, and plumper than the western flower thrips. And if you can see them, the western flower thrips have hairs on the tip of the abdomen. And the western flower thrips move in a curved S shape, especially the older instars because they can bend their body. Um, so they have a little bit of different activity. And we've developed um, these sorts of charts and pictures that can be downloaded off the off my website and showing the different instars so that you can tune your eyes up at the beginning of the year and think about the shapes and make that decision. Biological control of citrus thrips is extremely difficult. The predatory mite assists but doesn't completely reduce populations below the economic threshold. Um, but it is an important component. Uh, Joe Morris did lots and lots of work on parasitic wasps and uh, thrips predators and fungal pathogens and decolate snails and basically came up with very little efficacy from any of these items. Um, we think maybe the decolate snails lower the pupil population, the other wasps and predators, he just could not get them to work. So I think we're really down to Eusaeus tularensis, the predatory mite, as being the most significant uh, biological control agent. But what that forces you to do is to utilize insecticides that hopefully complement that predatory mites activity. So one of the points I wanted to make was that soft insecticides are easy on natural enemies and allow the predatory mite to work with you, to work with the insecticides. So an example of that would be Veritran um, plus molasses for the citrus thrips. You can see in this picture, the black line, the, the um, thrips population dropped dramatically with the Veritran treatment and the predatory mites were, were unaffected and, and were assisting with control, at least for a period of time. In the case of Bathroid, you're knocking out the predatory mites pretty effectively. They do come back eventually, but they're not assisting with thrips control during that critical period when the fruit is very small. So 
a broad spectrum pesticide like a pyrethroid would knock down both the thrips and the predatory mites. So one of the charts that I've come up with, and I'm about to publish this in Citrograph magazine, is um, a chart that talks about the different natural enemies in the system and what the various insecticides do to uh, the, whether they're toxic or soft and allow them to survive or not. So in general terms, uh, the, the organophosphates and carbamates, uh, because our natural enemies have been in the system for so long, they're fairly tolerant of those sorts of chemicals. Um, decades of exposure has made them pretty tolerant. Um, pyrethroids are very toxic to all three groups of natural enemies, the parasites, the predatory mites, and the predatory beetles. Uh, Savanto is pretty toxic to parasites, but soft on the predatory mite. Um, success is pretty soft all around. Delegate is, a, is related, it's in the same group as success. And so you would think it would be soft on natural enemies, but it's greater persistence, I think, uh, makes a big difference. So when we do tests, we find that it's actually pretty toxic to, to the parasites, somewhat toxic to predatory mites, and reduces the egg production of the Vidalia beetles. So while you might consider that one to be a pretty soft insecticide relative to Carzol or some of the older chemicals, it does have some toxicity. I think the saving grace is that with thrips materials you're tending to apply them to the outside of the tree so you're not treating every square inch of the tree which allows the natural enemies to to sort of uh, recover or uh, renew their their work in the orchard in the tree canopy fairly quickly hey beth can i yeah. interrupt you for a second sure um so antonin had a question um what was the rate of veritran and molasses um, I don't have that off the top of my head. I would say look at the UCIPM guidelines and you would be able to see that. Any other questions? Uh, we do have a few more if, if you want to take a break for those. Let me finish this one slide and then I will take a break. Okay. Um, Agrimec tends to be toxic to the predatory mites. It is a miticide. Uh, Exaril is soft for pretty much every group and Minectopro is again, t because it's a combination of Exaril and Agrimec in essence, um, it's toxic to the predatory mites. So that, those are sorts of considerations when you're treating for citrus thrips. If you want the natural enemies, in, in our case for thrips, the predatory mites to survive, then you would wanna be using some of these softer chemicals to allow them to get through fine. And I noticed I didn't put Veritran in here, but it would be soft for everything. Okay. So I'm ready to take some questions. You want to do that first and then we'll do the polling questions or vice versa? Yeah, yeah, I think that's okay. good. Okay, so Judy asked a question in the chat. Um, do citrus thrips attack other fruit trees as well? I'm trying to think, not that I know of. They're native to sumac, so they do have other hosts. Um, the only other crop that they attack aggressively and cause problems would be blueberries. Okay, thank you. And then um, Emily asked, does mulching reduce thrips and uh, by increasing microorganisms in soil attacking pupating thrips? I don't have any direct research to answer that question, but my, my guess would be yes, because we do find that organic growers tend, especially those that have cover crops or mulching going on, tend to have lower thrips populations in citrus than those that are keeping clean orchard floor. Okay, and then a couple more. Um, how does the restrictions help when growers of grapes or other crops continually spray for citrus thrips? I noticed that when growers do not all spray at the same time, they chase them around. I don't think the other crops are spraying for citrus thrips, so I'm a little bit confused by that question. I don't think I can answer that one. Okay, and then um, one more from Sarah. Do flower thrips damage leaves on young trees? Not that I know of. Flower thrips are a problem in other crops, but not in citrus. We really just ignore them and they really only come in, they're really only interested in the flowers, they're not interested in the leaves. Okay, and that, that's all the questions right at this point. Okay, then I would say we go ahead and go to the polling. So in this first polling, we have six questions and I'll be showing them by two. 
And I want now to invite all of you to start responding the first two questions now. Okay, I'm not getting any more responses, so I will publish the results of this first. Okay, so one to five is the big one, which means that we've got a lot of people who are new to citrus. And generally speaking, the, the major group is one to two percent tolerance for citrus thrips fruit scarring. And we go to the next two questions. Okay, so most of you are treating when thrips reach a critical threshold. Um, and 68% of you are considering predatory mite levels when deciding to spray. That's a good thing. Um, the critical threshold question is interesting because I've asked it previously of other groups and um, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, what is that critical threshold? I don't think we have as uh, clear cut a one as we used to have um, and it's probably pretty individual. I think we're ready to go on to the next two. Uh, Beth, while um, people are answering the poll, I do have one other question. Sure. Okay, um, this one's from Antonin. Uh, regarding the other crops, I always assumed the citrus thrips were flying in because the numbers would jump drastically in a matter of a day, sometimes a hundredfold. I struggle a lot because the numbers we experience do cause significant damage to the trees and can stunt them. Yeah, I don't think they're coming in from outside. I think they're emerging in your orchard. Thrips are pretty local. They're not big migrators. Um, so it's probably just they're, they appear pretty fast and you just gotta be watching, watching, watching for those early instars so that you can get a jump on them when they're on the young fruit. Okay, um, how often do you spray for thrips in mature orchards? A lot of people said sometimes I don't. Um, quite a few said once, fewer said twice. That's actually really good. We had a, another tough year. Um, and in non-bearing, um, I need you to scroll down on that one for me. Um, there are some people that aren't spraying young citrus non-bearing at all. And then there are some that are spraying it two, three or more than three times. So we've got some variation there but the majority are not spraying for thrips. You're probably spraying for other things like leaf miner. Okay, I think we're ready to go on, correct? There we go. Okay, so there are a number of pesticides recommended for control of citrus thrips in the UCIPM guidelines for citrus. You can get those on the web and there's the website there. Um, you have selective materials that are soft, that are, are fairly soft, unnatural enemies. Things like Success or Entrust, Delegate, Agrimec, Exeril, Minecto Pro, and Veritran D. Um, and then you have broad spectrum materials like the pyrethroids, bathroid and Danitol, and the organophosphates and carbamates like Carzol, Saigon, Dimethoate. Um, most of the growers have shifted away from the broad spectrum materials because the thrips develop resistance in the San Joaquin Valley to those pretty fast. And then the rest of those, we're doing a pretty good job on um, considering. This little chart just shows you since 1991 what the pesticide use has been like in the San Joaquin Valley. Originally it was dimethoate, carzol, then cyflutherin came in and then um, success entered the picture and that got in the green bars there, it got quite a bit of use. And then um, everyone shifted the majority of their uses of from cyflutherin to bathroid. Uh, Danitol came into the picture and then more recently the the Agrimic, the Delegate, and the Exeril. Um, a lot of the broader spectrum chemicals are still used because they get katydids really well and so there's a lot of tank mixing that goes on in the early spring with very low rates of pyrethroids or OPs for the katydid, and then the more selective chemicals for the, the citrus thrips, uh, things like Delegate and Agrimec and Exeril. I want to show you a couple of trials. Um, we've done lots of trials and have lots more data, but these are just examples of what we try and do. 
we, and this is in 2015, we treated with various chemicals and we treated twice, once at petal fall and once two weeks later. Um, I could have monitored the insects and probably done a better job, but we're just trying to get the relative efficacy between these treatments. And you see two columns at the end, percent total scarring and then percent severe scarring. So that would be the categories three and four scars. Uh, the untreated control had 6% severe scarring. The Movento and the Savanto were not significantly different from that. So they didn't really control the thrips um, much better than the, um, than the untreated control. The next group of insecticides, the Actara, the Veritran, the Entrust, and the Agriflex, significantly reduced, but didn't get it below the 1% level. The chemicals that worked absolutely the best were Agrimec, Exeril, Delegate, and we did two rates of Exeril, so there's two rates in there. Those chemicals push the, pot, the scarring level down below 1%, which is what most people are trying to shoot for. So in the green and the pink areas, you've got chemicals that work against uh, the citrus thrips and they can be rotated and used at different times to make sure you're not selecting for resistance. Here's another trial in 2016. Again, we did two treatments, one at petal fall and one two weeks later. We were looking at seven and Bexar, which neither of which controlled the, the thrips at all. We actually ended up with higher scarring in those treatments. The untreated control in that year had a lot of scarring, 13%, very high, severe scarring. Um, uh, the micromite had some effect on reducing thrips, which was kind of a surprise. PQZ is a new Nichino product that isn't registered yet, um, and it had some pretty good thrip suppression. But again, the best treatments were Delegate, Minecto Pro, and Exorel. Um, those kept the scarring level, severe scarring levels down below 1%. In 2017, we did a couple different uh, experiments. In the top one, we looked at Bexar again. Um, and this time we got better control with the Bexar uh, than the previous trial. Fujimite did not control thrips. Um, it's not really meant to be a thrips material, but the registrant was curious about that. And again, the best products were Delegate, Agrimec, PQZ, Exeril, Minecto Pro. And in the second experiment, the the Savanto and the Mavento did well. The percent severe scarring in that year was uh, less than the previous year. Remember the previous year we had 13% severe scarring in the controls, 4% um, and 2%, 2 to 3% in the, these two trials. So the pressure was less. So one of the points I would make is that there are actually quite a few chemicals that can control thrips some do it better than others, especially when the pressure is intense. And so your strategy might change depending on whether it's a hot, dry spring or a cool, wet spring. But in any case, you have more options than what you generally you're using. Uh, most of the growers are using uh, delegate and heavy reliance on delegate for 20 years now is, is not a good thing. You're gonna select for resistance. So trying to mix it up when you have years when the pressure is less is a really important point. Uh, this is our 2018 trial. Uh, again, two treatments of each of these. We added oil to all the treatments, just to even the score. The Savanto really struggled. We had an extremely severe scarring in the untreated controls. And I think that's because the weather got cool and then it got hot and then it got cool and then it got hot. And so the thrips were sort of pulsing in their emergence and we didn't hit it very well. And there was a lot of scarring. Um, so I think in this situation, the Savanto struggled to control the thrips. I don't think it has the, the level of persistence that some of the other chemicals like Delegate and Agrimec and Exeril have, which have more translaminar activity um, and just persist in the leaves longer. The best products again were Minecto Pro and Delegate and the PQZ, which isn't registered yet, did, did well. So this picture just shows you this year, 2018, petal fall, when, when we applied our treatments, um, petal fall occurred and then we had these 
super cool days and then super warm days and then super cool and then it got warm again. So when things fluctuate like that, it's, it gets a lot more unpredictable as to when the thrips will be present and timing, if we had waited, prob probably we would have gotten better control with these chemicals. I've been often asked by chemical companies, well, should I do Mavento first and Delegate second or Delegate first and Mavento second? And we don't really see huge differences. If a chemical is effective, it works in either slot. But we're looking at small plots. We're looking at groups of four trees. We're not looking at whole orchards. So I think there's still some more work to be done to figure out which might work best as the first treatment if you're, if you're gonna need two because it's a, a heavy thrips pressure year. So it's gonna vary and we need to do some more work on that. Exoril tends to paralyze the insects so they stop feeding so they die more slowly. Um, so there's all sorts of strategies of, well, you know, do I want to use the stronger pesticide first or the slower acting one? There's, there's just all sorts of strategies going on out there. Now, one of the things that uh, Dr. Ro Jay Rosenheim at UC Davis, his postdoc, Bodil Cass, has been working on is they took this huge database of, of pest control advisor records and yields relating to those by individual growers and they analyzed that data and they saw a really clear pattern from the sampling data from the pest control advisors. They have literally thousands of uh, records that they went through and grouped. They, they saw a clear effect that thrips populations appear one to two weeks after petal fall and then there was another pulse that resulted in damage at weeks seven and eight. So in our experiments, we were treating, in, for example, in week one and then in week three. Well, their point would be maybe the treatments need to be spread out more and they're now running uh, physical experiments in orchards at Lynn Cove. The, the next two years, they'll be doing that to determine if you, is it better to treat, to uh, control the thrips or the thrips doing more damage during weeks one and two and seven and eight versus three, four, five, and six. So they're gonna be examining this in greater detail. And here's an example of their quantification. They're gonna basically cage thrips on fruit and see when they damage them the most. They're also gonna survey thrips densities on different citrus species because they're also seeing in that data, um, in that big database that they've got that some of the mandarin varieties, not all, but some of them seem to be very um, tolerant of thrips and don't show damage. And so that would potentially allow growers to back off of treatments um, in certain varieties and, and not be treating so much for citrus thrips. Insecticides that work the best when thrips pressure is heavy are those that are most effective. Things like Delegate, x or Minectopro. Insecticides that control thrips when thrips pressure is light to moderate include Veritrans, Success, Agrimex, Savanta, and PQZ. Let's point out PQZ isn't registered yet. Insecticides with resistance issues are Carzol, Dimethoate, Bathroid, and Danitol, and possibly Delegate. So citrus thrips develop resistance quite easily for most chemicals. They develop resistance to the DDT in the 50s, organophosphates in the 60s, carbamates in the 70s, pyrethroids in the 90s, and they have very high levels of resistance to delegate and success in blueberries because they spray more frequently in blueberries than they do in citrus. But there's been a really heavy reliance on success and delegate, and remember they're sister products in the same chemical category. Um, uh, since 1998, so 20 years. Um, so that's of concern. So one of the things we've been doing is we worked with Joe Morris. He had a susceptible uh, thrips colony down at UC Riverside lab colony. And when he tested his at 0.1 part per million, the majority of them died. And we have a colony here at Lynn Cove and it stems from just 
thrips that came in from the field into our greenhouse and we test them and we get nearly complete kill at one part per million so they've got some level of resistance so what we decided to do is take one part per million and 10 part per million and go out into the into orchards and start testing them and last year we tested 12 orchards this year we're just we're just starting up again so we just have a few more to add to that database at the moment but what we found was that there are some populations three in particular that showed a hundred percent kill at one part per million and i would say were susceptible we had some that were showed a little bit of survival at one part per million which our lab colony does i mean our greenhouse colony so that says to me there's some level of resistance but then we had six populations that had less than 85 percent uh, mortality at one part per million some of them only had 50 percent so those populations i would say are of concern because um, they're surviving the residues over a two-day period and um, 50 percent of the population so one comment i would make is people say well what happens when we have resistance is, or is the chemical not going to work anymore and i say no the chemical will keep working it just won't work for as long a period of time and uh, so the residual is short and you're killing part of the population but not all the population or not as much of the population so it comes back quicker I'm not sure what I wanted to say with that slide so we'll go on so my general thrips spray recommendations are to use outside coverage and 200 gallons per acre um, timing is really important you want to be treating as those first instars are emerging not before not after right about the time they emerge. A lot of the chemicals require additives, things like Delegate, Success, and Trust, Exeril, Minectopro really need the oil or some other additive to get them into the leaf and make them more effective. And Veritran requires sugar or molasses to attract the, the thrips to the product. And some of these chemicals, Veritran in particular, can be really thrown off if you add nutritionals or if the pH is off. So you need to check the labels and check with your dealers to make sure that the product you've chosen um, can be mixed with anything else. Otherwise it needs to be, go on its own. And I would apply insecticides only as needed as much as possible. Uh, get away from spraying on a calendar and try and survey for the thrips. And then finally rotate your insecticide chemistries to avoid resistance. And I think that was my point on this previous slide was you've got success and delegate are one group, Agrimex another group, XRL is another group, um, Sabadil is another group, the Veritran, and then you've got some of these older compounds as well. So you have different chemical groups. If you rely solely on one of these pesticide classes, you will continue to select for resistance. Now, so you might ask, well, why haven't we already got really high levels of resistance to delegate if we've been using it for 20 years? It, the thrips develop resistance to, um, to some of the older chemicals much faster than that. And that suggests to me that it's probably not a dominant resistance. It's, it's something that is inherited in a recessive way. And so if you stop using the chemical, you should be able to regain use of it it should work better in the future if you back off of it for a period of time or keep rotating with other insecticide classes okay that was pretty much it for my presentation now we're going to do a second round of polling questions so um, peter you are welcome to bring those up and cheryl while he's doing that if you've got some questions that popped up that you want to ask feel free to do that yeah, there are uh, two questions um, right now. The first one's from George, and he asks, has CRISPR gene drive been considered action for thrips and other citrus pests? CRISPR, okay, yeah, that's being considered for the Asian citrus psyllid. I don't think anyone uh, in the molecular world has focused on any of our common pests yet. They're really just trying to get this Asian citrus psyllid thing fixed. But yes, uh, it is being considered and being worked on. Okay, and then the second one's from Tori, um, says a lot of people say they do not treat non-bearing trees for citrus thrips. Should we not worry about the citrus thrips stunting the vegetative growth of the tree? Our 
old, old data shows that it doesn't matter in navels and valentias. You don't really stunt the growth of the tree, but we're in a new era now. Um, we've got the drought, which really drives these thrips populations. We also have leaf miner now. Before 2000, we didn't have leaf miner in the system. So now you've got a combination of two pests damaging that new foliage. So it's, I would say it's, in the old days, I would say, don't worry about it, ignore it don't do anything about it. But now I say, well, you got to look at the conditions, you got to look at your plants, and you got to look at the level of leaf miner damage you got in there too, because I think the combined thrips and leaf miner damage can, can really make a difference on those young trees. Okay, so 59% of you are using delegate, and then there's kind of an even mix of Xrel, Minecto Pro, and Agrimec. Minecto Pro is actually a combination of Exoril and Agrimec. So you're really using three chemical classes primarily. Um, I guess I can scroll down and look at the rest. And then some successor and trust is pretty heavy used too. Um, yeah, successor and trust, Minec and Exoril are probably the two softest on natural enemies. If I have to treat more than once for thrips during the same season, I tend to rotate between different chemicals. Good, 92% uh, of you. So you're already thinking about resistance and I think that's really good. I think we've harped on that for many years and, and it's made a difference. Okay, I think we're ready for the next set of questions. And this is our first ever webinar. So we're, we're learning as we go here. Do you think you have delegate resistance in one or more orchards? Um, about 18% of you said yes, 44% said no, and 38% said maybe. So there's really quite a few maybes. Uh, we are doing that sampling or, or bioassays. So if you're interested in participating, you can get in contact with me. What two generations of thrips should treatments be directed to? The second and the third are the correct answers. So we had some people who thought it was first, but remember first generation is on the leaves. It isn't until the second generation that they get to the fruit. And for years we've said, don't treat thrips on leaves on mature trees because you really wanna save the chemicals for that period when they're on the fruit. Okay, we're next, ready for the next set of polling questions. Yeah, we've moved from practices and opinions to knowledge. All right, so I will share the results. Okay. Okay, second instar is the most damaging. It's got bigger mouth parts than the first instar. You're, you're trying to time your treatments for the first instar so you don't get the, let them get to the second instar, but yeah, the second instar is the, the most damaging. And what conditions increase citrus thrips? The hot, dry springs that we've been having a lot lately. So that's why we've had trouble with thrips. Okay, next set of questions. Okay, um, those of you who clicked on Xrel are correct. Agrimec is a miticide, so it's actually fairly toxic to predatory mites. They will come through it, but it, it's harder on them than the Xrel is. And the 0 0.5 per leaf is the UCIPM uh, threshold level of predatory mites that we consider to be really helpful. Um, Less than that, they're not so helpful. More than that, they're super helpful. But the minimum, the threshold is 0.5. Uh, next set of polling questions. Okay, yes, Xrel is the one that really, really needs oil. You could spray Carzol or Bathroid and you would get the thrips whether you had oil or not. Uh, and they, Type of coverage, definitely outside. If you go really heavy coverage, it's just not needed. The thrips are on the outside of the tree and so less, less water volume is better. You just wanna miss the outside. Okay, so we don't have any other questions at this point, but we can um, take a few more um, if anybody has any. And just a couple more things. Um, before we go, um, the next webinar is going to be on November 14th with Ben Faber speaking on avocado diseases. And that registration is open now. 
And also, um, if you do need additional CEUs, you can always go to our website and see um, the many online courses that we offer. We have several Citrus courses um, and we have several others. We have a couple that will count towards laws and regulation. And so I will also include in the chat the link to our training website and I'll put my email in the chat too if anybody has any um, need to contact me after this webinar ends. So I'll go ahead and add those links now. I'd also like to comment that our little UC Ag Experts talk, we're, we're starting with citrus and avocado because that's our expertise. We may expand other crops down the line, but we're, we're really gonna focus on those two crops for the moment. But if you have subject matter within those two crops that you're really interested in, um, please put that in the chat or in your feedback as to what subjects you'd like us to cover. Our hope is to do one of these a month in the middle of the month and get different speakers every time so that we get some variety in here and, uh, and opportunities for you to learn. And these will be recorded. So if you want to reflect on what I've said, you're, you will be able to get access to it and, and review the recordings. Only the live webinars provide CE units, the recording does not, but it is a great reference. Are there any questions? Um, let's see, there is one here. Um, oh, uh, Antoine, can we come visit in uh, individual issues to discuss individual issues? Sure, give me a call and we can, we can work something out. Okay, and I think um, right now it doesn't look like we have any other questions, so um, I think we're at four o'clock, so. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Beth, for um, putting this on. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And I hope the rest of you, everybody enjoys the rest of your day. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Made my day. Thanks. <laughs>